Almost there. Don't you worry. Oh, this is weird. I can see myself. Can I minimize that? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we should be streaming on Facebook Live. Or streaming live on Facebook. So I'm going to share my screen again. And what time is it? In like 30 seconds to a minute, I can get the ball rolling. How's that sound? Great. Let's get this up. Boom. Okay, I'm going to turn my video off so I'm not um, on this monitor Facebook, but I'll, I'll monitor the chats and things um, and help help you with the questions and things. Um, all right. Thanks. Awesome. All right, cool. All right, then I think we're good to go ahead and get started um, unless someone screams at me to stop. So thank you everyone for joining us for uh, this edition of Biology on Tap as part of the Science Festival at Michigan State University. Hopefully you've been taking part in all the other cool talks and activities and et cetera going on at Science Fest. Um, before I introduce our two speakers for today, I first want to do a, if PowerPoint will advance, there we go, a land acknowledgement, though obviously we're on Zoom, and not all together in one place, we think it's still important to acknowledge that Michigan State University um, occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires, Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. Uh, in particular, uh, MSU resides on land that was ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw, and we recognize, support, and adv advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations uh, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. Um, by offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold MSU more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. Okay, I already said welcome to Biology on Tap. Um, so I will introduce our two speakers. Um, they will do their thing and then we'll have space for questions at the end and we'll have both myself and Julie Jarvie monitoring the chat um, both here on Zoom and on Facebook so that no questions go missed. Um, so I already see a question in the Q&A so I'm not going to check it right now because I'm talking. Without further ado, I will <laughs> introduce our two speakers, Allison Young and Olivia Utley. They're both PhD students at Michigan State University in the Department of Integrative Biology. Um, they're both great people. Uh, Allison's in my lab. Uh, it's not my lab. We're in the same lab together. Um, so she's great. Olivia's not in the same lab as me, but she's still cool anyways. And they're going to talk to us about the glamorously unglamorous life of field biologists. So I will stop sharing my screen and let them share theirs. Assuming Zoom lets them do it. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Now I'll mute myself. Sorry, everybody. It took me just a second to find the unmute button. Um, thank you, Darren, for that introduction. And thank you for the land acknowledgement. I really appreciate that. We are going to talk today about the glamorously unglamorous life of a field biologist. Um, Allison and I concocted this talk after she and I had a short conversation about the fact that a lot of people don't really know what it looks like to be a scientist or more specifically a field biologist. Um, and we thought it would be a nice way to bring to our friends and family and the community what that really looks like. So um, without further ado, we'll get right into it. Um, just a short introduction for Allison and I. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the integrative biology department, like Darren mentioned. Um, I'm in Dr. Catherine Lindell's lab, um, and we study raptor, well, I study raptor foraging ecology and the effects on songbird anti-predator responses. So I look at how songbirds um, respond to predators in the area and how they manage those potential risks. 
Um, and we actually apply our research to the potential services that raptors can provide in blueberry and cherry crops in Michigan. So we know that raptors can deter pests in those type crops. Um, and uh, I apply my research to that. Uh, hi, I'm Allison. Um, as Darren said, I am in the same lab as him. We are a B lab. I am currently in my sixth year of my PhD. I am defending in right around a month, which is both terrifying and exciting. Uh, I am generally a behavioral ecologist like Olivia, though I probably have more emphasis on the behavior part. And my research focuses on understanding what factors of the environment are shaping how honeybees search for food because the world isn't constant. So as the world changes around them, how are they making decisions about what food to eat, when to look for new food, et cetera. And I do this uh, with actually a few different honeybee species to see how it differs um, and how things like how long they live or how big they are affects their behavior. And so I've done a lot of my research here in Michigan, and then a lot of it has also been done in India, studying some Asian honeybees over there. I just want to chime in and add one additional fun fact about Allison and I is that though we did not know each other prior to Michigan State, we did both graduate from the University of Kentucky and are both from Kentucky. Um, so that was always, that was fun to figure out. So. Bio on Tap, if you've never been to Bio on Tap, is typically a pretty casual event where we talk about science and joke with each other um, in a public setting in a community. And usually this talk occurs in a bar. Um, and so it is typically a, a more mature audience, or the, although we don't get outrageous, um, but it is a fun and casual environment. And so we're gonna give you an outline because we're going to be professional-ish tonight. Um, so just a quick outline of our talk, we're going to go through the steps in a field study and actually in general science. Um, then we're going to talk about different types of data you can get in field studies. We'll go over the perks of being a bi field biologist, which Allison has um, laid out many wonderful examples and some awesome pictures from her own research. And then we will talk about where you might find field biologists working. So we know that you know, you may know us personally, or you may know a field biologist personally, but we're just one example of field biologists. So we want to kind of cover all of the natural habitats of a field biologist. So just a little bit of a disclaimer and some important information in this presentation. Um, all of the research that you see, all of the handling and interaction with animals um, are legally permitted by the uh, federal government or the state government, whichever um, oversight organization is appropriate. So we do have to get permits to do most of our research, especially with vertebrates like birds, fish, um, amphibians and reptiles. Um, although I'm sure there's permitting as well with uh, invertebrates, depending on what you're doing. And we also work with the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, meaning um, this, is the, this is the organization that oversees animal research or specifically vertebrate research to make sure that what we're doing is ethical um, and that we are doing the least amount of harm to animals in our research. Um, so with that, we just wanna remind everyone, please don't go out and bother your local neighborhood wildlife. Don't try to start tagging animals that run through your backyard. Um, however, if these sound like programs that are interesting to you, there are programs where you can volunteer to participate in research and help scientists collect data and often get hands on experience with specific types of wildlife. So if you're ever interested in that, feel free to Google it. Um, you may potentially contact someone at the university. I uh, unfortunately I don't have a contact listed but um, that you guys can reach out to. But if you're ever interested, you can look that up and uh, potentially find someone to reach out to and see if you can participate in research projects. So moving past the disclaimer, we're gonna run through the steps in a field study and truthfully all scientific studies. Um, and we have a quick little outline here, but I'm gonna go through these in a little more detail. So in a scientific study, usually what happens or what typically happens is that you read a ton of other science, you identify some gaps in the knowledge, um, you design a study to research those gaps, then you do your study, 
you do statistical analysis on the data you collected from the study, you write up and publish your research, and then you present your research to the public. So the first thing that most incoming grad students and most scientists do when they start um, in the field that they conduct research in is that they read a lot of other science. And pretty much what this looks like is sitting at your laptop in your office for hours a day, scanning through um, research papers that other scientists have published in peer reviewed science journals. And excuse me, so you often scan through these papers and you look at all of the other research that has been done in the field that you are in to figure out what we already know. So um, a lot of information that you get in classrooms from textbooks are very, I wouldn't call it old information, but it is more concrete information that has been researched over and over again. And so these are things scientists are very sure of that we then teach to uh, students in classroom settings all the way from K through 12 and into college. Um, but once you get into graduate school, you're really looking at like the most recent research in the field that is still fresh, that still needs to be studied. And um, you're looking at this research because what you are looking for is a gap in the knowledge. You are looking for things that scientists have, you know, kind of started filling in the pieces and putting the information together, but there's still more that we don't know. Um, and so once you have identified the gaps in the knowledge um, in your field of study, then you design a study to research one or you know two of those gaps. Um, you might identify like a very specific variable in a study system that re other researchers have not had the chance to look at yet. Um, and then you decide whether or not this is an important variable. And then you design a study to research that gap in the knowledge. And then you do the study. Um, and one thing we want to emphasize is oftentimes when you're designing a study, um, you, you are pulling justifications from lots of other scientific papers. So if I say I'm going to observe a bird for five minutes, then I have to find like another study that says like why observing a bird for five minutes and not 10 minutes was the appropriate amount of time to observe a bird. Um, and so you pull all these pieces together and you design the study. And then when you're, and you've put a lot of effort into this, potentially years of effort into writing this proposal, after you've written the design for your study um, and you go out and you try to do it in the field, um, it doesn't always work. It's not always perfect. And so a lot of times what end up ends up happening is that you go back and you try new things, you make adjustments in the field, um, and you do it a couple years in a row so that you can finally collect quality data. And once you collect your quality data, quote unquote quality data, um, you have to do a few things to do your statistical analysis. So nowadays, even in fields like ecology, um, we are using a massive data set. So these data sets can include anywhere from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of data points. Um, and if you can imagine like clicking through an Excel sheet and finding like small errors, it's exceptionally difficult. And so the first thing that we do is um, we quote unquote wrangle our data. Um, we often, while we store our data in things like Excel, we often use um, programs like R or Python to clean our data up because I can tell, for example, R to go look at all of the different um, all of the different types of words in a specific column um, and tell me what's in that column. And then R can tell me like, oh, there are 30 different types of categories that you put for this particular variable. Um, for example, if I have a column that says season, which I notice Allison has here on her data set, for the most part, you might have autumn, spring, summer, but somebody might have misspelled autumn a few times in a few different places. And so I have to go back through and find those misspellings and make sure that they're all spelled absolutely correctly so that the program uh, runs the statistical analysis correctly. And so I can use R to do that. And this is essentially data wrangling. And it does actually take a little while to clean up all your data and make sure that it's consistent so that you're able to do the analysis. And following uh, your data wrangling, you do your statistical analysis, which is where you ask, uh, you write code for this program 
to examine the relationship between different variables that you've collected data on. So uh, this can actually be really tricky because a lot of times it's also learning how to code properly and make sure making sure that you've spelled things correctly in the program, making sure that um, you're not making any syntax errors, that you're not missing things like a parentheses or that you haven't capitalized a word when it was supposed to be lowercase. Um, it's very small details. And so it can be really, really frustrating for scientists. And uh, you will catch grad students joking all the time about chucking their laptop out of a window. Um, and so statistical analysis can all make us feel a little bit crazy. And after you've done all of this work, you've done your design and you've written your proposal and then you've done the study itself and then you analyze all of your data, you have to write up and publish your research. And often by the time you get to this point, you've done so many different versions of your research and you've had to make so many different adjustments in the process that it just kind of feels like a dumpster fire. And so you have this giant dumpster fire and you have to uh, clean it up and put the fire out. And um, your goal at this point is to even just get like a nice, clean, organized dumpster. And so once you have organized your research into this, um, you know, this piece that has a very clear like essentially story where you introduce your research, you justify it, you present your methods, and then you present your results and you talk about your results in a discussion. Um, you submit your research to a journal and a journal is essentially any publishing body that will publish your research, but prior to publishing it, they have people who other scientists who peer review your work. And this often means that they take your submitted manuscript or your you know, written up research and they send it out to other people. And these other people look at your research and they tell you what you need to go back and fix. So a lot of times they'll send it back to you and they'll say, um, you know, you did these things, but we also think you need to include this data or we have questions about this research. Um, did you study this or you need to do this kind of statistical analysis? And so a lot of times it feels like you're on one quest and then they send you on another quest. And finally, after you send it back to uh, the journal, um, after you've made your edits to your research and you've incorporated the suggestions that the reviewers have made, uh, you submit your manuscript and they publish it for other researchers to use to fill in the gaps and knowledge. And so a lot of times, in addition to this, researchers will present their research to the public at things like conferences, um, where we can disseminate the most recent research to each other and kind of talk about like what we're working on now so that we're all on the same page and we're all not studying the exact same thing over and over again. Um, and a lot of times what happens that's fun when you present your research is you either have people who don't know a lot about what you research and they're asking you questions um, that you don't know how to answer because it's kind of out of the scope of your research, or you have people who have been doing it a lot longer than you who have a lot more experience and they're asking you questions that you don't know how to answer because you didn't consider it. Um, and so uh, presenting your research is always kind of a fun way to keep you on your toes about your own science. So we wanted to cover um, some of the methods of field studies and why they are glamorous. We've already covered the steps of field studies and general science, and now we really want to talk about why field studies are so glamorous. Um, so one way that we collect data through field studies is point counts and transects, and these are essentially when we go out into the world and we're counting the number of organisms, uh, a specific type of animal um, that we're looking for um, in an area. And so this is actually a picture of my lab mates and I doing transects, excuse me, and point counts in blueberry fields in Michigan. On the left is a picture of me doing transects, and that is where every summer for two summers, uh, my lab mates and I walked a total of 64 miles every other weekend um, where we counted the number of American kestrels we saw. And American kestrels are actually uh, North America's smallest falcon. And so we were looking for these falcons to see if putting up nest boxes attracted them to the landscape. Um, and it was always hot. 
it was always sweaty. It was like 95 degrees and I had to walk 16 miles every other weekend um, because we split that 64 up among 14 of, or four of us. Um, and it was just a lot of work. Um, and it was also very shady because we were walking along these rural backcountry roads in Michigan and people would come out and ask like, are you okay? Are you lost? Um, are, is your truck broken down? And we would just have to explain to them, no, I'm just out counting falcons. Um, and on, in the right picture is actually a picture of my lab mate Sarah and I looking for the number of birds that come in and out of this blueberry crop to see how active blue, uh, songbirds are in blueberry crops. And another way that we did uh, counts of species was using video cameras. Um, this is not legal if you are doing it with other humans, but with birds, we were able to stick cameras into the nest boxes uh, that we put up for these American kestrels to see um, if there were any American kestrel babies inside and to see um, how many babies there were. And so we would do this quick check, write down the number of babies that there were or the number of eggs we saw um, and then we would record that and move on. And this also allowed us to keep track of the number of active American kestrels in the area. So another type of data that we sometimes collect when we work out in the field is data uh, from marking animals. That's an, um, when we mark animals, there are a lot of different ways that you can do that to collect information about their movement patterns, their lifespan, just the number of individuals in an area. And for me, when I mark animals, I'm using numbered tags. So that picture on the right are some of the bees that I've used in my experiments. And I'm able to train them to a feeder and mark them with a little tag that's got their own little color and number so I can identify that bee as an individual. And then I can watch it, see how long it comes back, how long it lives, how many times it forages, etc. cetera. Uh, other people uh, will often collar animals. And so you might've seen pictures potentially, there are a lot of times used for large mammals. Uh, so like elk or uh, elephants or lions or big mammals mostly. And those collars are often have a GPS in them. So you can track movement patterns of the animal in the habitat, um, tagging, or banding is often done on birds. So you can see some of those pictures on the left. And so that's where uh, researchers will put a little metal tag around the leg of a bird often. And those, the position of the tag, like which leg it's on and the color, the size can help individually identify uh, birds. Uh, and then pit tags are often used with fish or snakes uh, or reptiles. It's just another way of tagging. And we generally try to choose marks that will be non-invasive and non-disturbing, I guess, to animals. So like for me, I use be safe glue when I mark them and it's on their back. So they don't really care. They often don't even notice when I tag them because they're too busy feeding. Um, but it's actually kind of funny because sometimes the marks that we put on animals actually affects their behavior or their patterns or their sexual uh, success. So birds, for example, a lot of times uh, with bird species, sometimes those ones with colorful tags are more attractive to female birds if it's a male bird. And with collaring or tagging like an ear tag, um, elk have been known to uh, use the tags to reinforce their hierarchy. So like a dominant elk would grab the tag of a more subordinate elk and physically pull it away from food so that she could get the best food. And so then when that happens or when it seems to be affecting the population, you kind of have to rethink what you're doing and figure out a different way of marking them because the point is to observe without interfering. So, yeah. so uh, another common type of method that we use that Olivia has kind of already um, referenced is just observing. So that can, you, you're observing when you're taking point counts, um, that could be live. So uh, there's a picture on the bottom right of me and one of my undergrads observing bees uh, that I had trained to a feeder. A lot of times we will video animals and then review that video later to extract data from it. 
So for example, one of my experiments, I studied the activity patterns of a bee species that foraged at night uh, and they lived, they had their nest hanging off of the roof of the building. So I could not actually watch them. So instead I recorded them with an infrared camera and then later was able to review that footage and collect all of my data. Camera traps are another one that are really uh, well used and useful. Um, on the left there, you can see some funny pictures of a guy who found a person's camera trap out in the woods and decided to leave some little Easter eggs for them. And with camera traps, it just takes a picture or sometimes a short video anytime something moves usually. So if an animal walks by or sometimes even if a leaf falls, it'll take an image and then you can use those images to kind of calculate what animals are in the environment, how many of them, etc. So all very useful points of data. So another uh, type of methodology are often collecting samples. And uh, sometimes it's done more invasively where you might dart an animal and then collect blood. Uh, but a lot of times when you are taking samples from animals out in the field, you kind of use what you find. You might put out traps and as animals walk by them, their fur gets caught on it and then you can um, analyze that fur. So uh, uh, barbed wire fences, for example, a lot of fur will get caught on barbed wire fences. Uh, if you are studying certain species that have very discernible uh, fecal matter, fecal samples can be very easily collected and they can be used to get an idea of how many individuals are in a certain area. Same with saliva. In the whole camp lab here at MSU, for example, um, I know in their field work in Kenya, sometimes they'll put out like rope toys and the hyenas will uh, chew on those rope toys and then they can get the toys later and collect saliva after the fact. So you can get a lot of samples without ever touching an animal yourself, which is super, super useful. So um, one other example of data collection is using model specimens. Um, there was actually a very large science article about um, some researchers who put out clay caterpillars um, to see what kind of or organisms came by and chewed on the clay caterpillars. And my research, uh, one of my lab mates actually repl replicated the study by putting out clay caterpillars in uh, blueberry fields to see how many of them had gotten chewed on in the blueberry fields by different uh, organisms. In addition, there was a study that looked at how raptors influence uh, songbird predation by using raptor models, although it was much more convincing than this uh, plastic owl, because they did take um, stuffed museum specimens of raptors and put robotic motors inside of them so that the, the stuffed specimens moved like a live raptor. Um, you guys can see here that this red-shouldered red hawk is not buying this owl model. And so this is a really cool way to um, introduce um, an organism to a system when you can't actually physically put the live organism there. So we've talked about kind of the steps of the study and some not a, by any means an exhaustive list of some methods that field biologists use, um, at least ones that we are more familiar with. Uh, there are many, many more, but we promised to talk about the glamorously unglamorous perks and mishaps and misadventures that you experience as a field biologist. So that's what we're gonna do now using stories of circumstances, often ridiculous, that we have experienced. So one of the first perks of being a field biologist is that uh, you get to make your own equipment. And so if you ever want to be MacGyver, like, this is an excellent way to be MacGyver. Uh, so these are both pictures from experiments I've done. And on the left, uh, this was a study that I did in India. I was on a campus of a university and I had to train bees from a nest to the ground. We were on the third story and the nest, uh, you can kind of see it in the little top right corner. There's a little dark spot. That's the colony of bees. Keep in mind, these bees are about twice the size of a honeybee that you might be familiar with, almost three times the size. And there's also about 60,000 
of them on that nest. They've literally stung people to death. Like there's a few people every year. It's very tragic where they get agitated and they kill someone, not because they're mean, but because they're disturbed and they are reacting defensively. So I had to train these bees to the ground so that I could study them, but they are literally hanging outside of a window in the lab kitchen. So to do that, I had to make friends with the lab kitchen employees and they allowed me to come in and take a, a little piece of bamboo that I literally found lying on the ground and put sugar water on it and then poke the colony basically and then try to lead them to the feeder that I had. It was like a little plastic feeder that had sugar water in it. I then had to train them to continue to follow the feeder once I put it in a bucket. That bucket was actually my laundry bucket. So uh, I just didn't have a laundry bucket for a while as I was training them. And then I had to MacGyver a way to lower it down. So I found some rope and I tied the rope to the handle of the bucket and to the random piece of bamboo that I found. And then I slowly lowered the bucket foot by foot, slowly over hours to the ground with the bees coming. And the rope was not very long. So about halfway through, I ended up having to put my whole body out of the window. So I was laying flat on the ledge, the third story ledge with 60,000 bees that have literally killed people <laughs> two feet above my head. And I'm my shoulders and my head are hanging off of this ledge and I'm slowly lowering, lowering bees down to my friend on the ground who's helping me. And it worked, I got them down, but it was also a bit ridiculous and I very well could have fallen out of the window, but I didn't, so it was fun. On the right hand side, you can see an even less beautiful example of some equipment that I rigged up where I had a colony of bees in an observation hive, which basically just means there are frames of bees in a box with glass on the side so we can watch their behavior. And I had to get them from that observation hive in this room, in this building, outside. And there is an entrance there. And so I had to get tubing between those two points. And there was not enough tubing. So I had to duct tape different bits of tubing together and duct tape it to the colony, duct tape it to the wall, and then just hope that the duct tape held. So that's why it's really, really ugly looking. And it did not always work. There were a few three different times that uh, it, the duct tape kind of just like fell, like it got, un, it didn't get, it got less sticky. And so the tube kind of slid. So all of the bees trying to go out, went out into the room. So I walked into the room one day and then there were 200 bees flying around very angry because they were trapped and they couldn't go outside. So I had to find a way to get them back out and get the tube back attached so that they could go about their normal business. And it did and it worked but you kind of have to be a little creative and MacGyver-esque when you work in a field setting. So another perk that is sometimes not a perk is that you get to really work in really isolated, often really beautiful research sites. So I did a lot of my work in India, but I wasn't really in the middle of the field there because I was on a campus. Um, but I've also been uh, I did a, a short course and study in Costa Rica. And as part of that, we went out on this fountain in the middle of these blueberry fields, or no, blackberry, sorry. Olivia's got me thinking of blueberry. They were blackberry fields. And we had to walk about two miles from where we were staying to the field site. So we'd walk there and then there's just mountains all around us. It was absolutely gorgeous. But to get there, we got a lot of scratches from the blackberry bushes. Um, if the weather changed, there was absolutely no shelter. And uh, we even had one point had an angry bull uh, kind of chase us <laughs> for a while. And we had to run and literally like launch ourselves over a fence to get away from it. So you get to work in really, really great places, but then you're also kind of on your own, which can be a blessing and a curse. Another perk, as a field biologist, you get to wear really fashionable clothing. It's, well, we call it field work chic is what I call it. Uh, but it's the sort of things where you probably wouldn't normally wear it out and about, but you gotta sacrifice fashion for function in this case. So uh, if you're somewhere muddy, you gotta wear really big waders or boots. 
when I was doing work in India, I always had literally my dad's old bucket hat that I wore every day, all day, because I just sat outside in the sun from about seven in the morning until about 7 p.m. I wore super baggy clothing to be cooler. And then a lot of times here in the U.S. working with bees, you have to wear a bee suit. And that's really fun when it is 85 degrees out and you're covered head to toe in really thick fabric. That's meant to protect you from bee stings, but it also means there's absolutely no ventilation. And you get to just hang out in those clothes and in your own sweat for hours. It's super fun and it's super gross, which makes it even more fun. Another perk of being a field biologist is that you get to see and work with a lot of dangerous animals. It's super great uh, for some people. I think it's kind of fun. It's also kind of scary at times. So for example, when I was in India, where I worked, there were tons of snakes, just snakes everywhere, especially during their mating season. So breeding season, I should probably say. But for example, one time I was doing an experiment and this snake decided to just come and check it out and did not want me to be there. I didn't want to be there either. Now this was a rat snake, so it wasn't venomous, but it was also very aggressive. So even if it wasn't venomous, it was still kind of dangerous. So I had to just abandon all of my research equipment and my experiment that I was halfway through and then just leave. Other times I almost stepped on snakes that were really camouflaged, including uh, a cobra once. That was fun. It reared up at me and I just had to back away slowly. Um, and then I didn't get any work done because it just hung out next to my equipment all day. Uh, maybe, maybe I just have bad luck because I work with bees, but also I frequently get stung, of course, because it's inevitable. Generally, honeybees are not very aggressive, but they are defensive if you aggravate them. So in this case, on the picture on the right, you can see um, my lip doesn't normally look like that. My top lip is about four or five si times its normal size because I got stung right between my nose and my lip and my cheeks swelled up, my lips swelled up, my nose swelled up, and I just couldn't eat or talk normally for a few days. I've also been stung on the nose and then had both my eyes swell shut. So again, just out for the count. So you kind of have to be prepared for anything and everything when it comes to animal encounters. Um, Allison was mentioning as well that uh, you do encounter dangerous animals often um, and that she has had some encounters with her own study species bees. My lab mate and I have also encountered the honeybees. Um, they use them as pollinators in fruit crops in Michigan. And so the growers will bring in large hives of honeybees to pollinate their blueberry crops or their cherry crops. And this picture, which I'd shown previously in the slideshow, is actually following an encounter with a honeybee. We are up here on these two ladders counting the number of songbirds we see count, come into this blueberry block. Um, but if you look a little closer, our buns, which are normally like pretty like tight and out of the way, are exceptionally loose. And that is because uh, Sarah got a honeybee in her bun. Uh, we had a couple come to check us out and one of the honeybees went in her bun and my instinct reaction was to take the clipboard from her with our data sheets and hit her in the head with it. So I actually did, I whacked her bun a couple times trying to get the bee out of her hair um, and then another one got in my hair and so we took turns leaping off of the ladder and shaking our hair out and shaking our clothes out um, while the other one continued to collect bird data. Um, in addition to uh, living in, or as a result of living in isolated spaces and um, living in areas that have potentially dangerous animals, uh, we actually had a grad student who hosted a wilderness first aid course at Michigan State one summer. She had a, a wilderness first aid responder come in and teach a course to us. Um, and we learned how to splint each other and how to deal with potential poisonings or potential bites from venomous animals, um, how to deal with um, any illnesses that might occur essentially like anywhere from like a few dozen to hundreds of miles away from the nearest, um, nearest healthcare provider. And so uh, this actually was a result of working uh, a few grad student groups or a few labs who work in environments where there are things like black mambas and gaboons and um, venomous spiders that are exceptionally dangerous. And so we all got to take this course um, and it was really enjoyable and it was really informative. 
And we frequently encounter Murphy's Law in the field. So even when we're well prepared, even when everything is planned, um, there are times where everything, even when your data collection is going well, something will go wrong while you're out in the field. Um, and I can speak of numerous times. I think every field biologist I know has had this experience at least once um, where their truck got stuck in the field and they had to find a way out. So this is my lab mate, Sarah, and I stuck in the back of a blueberry field in a very swampy, muddy area um, with our little two wheel drive, drive truck that had uh, not great tire tread. Um, and we had to call the nearest uh, blueberry grower that we knew and ask if he could use his tractor to pull us out because we'd spent about 45 minutes trying to get ourselves out and we were not able to. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this happened a couple more times to us this summer or that particular summer. So um, Murphy's Law is always lurking around the corner when you do field research. So one thing we want to mention is that um, as we wrap this talk up is that field studies are glamorously unglamorous. We've talked about the fact that we're in isolated areas, that there are all kinds of dangerous animals, that the climate is not always exceptionally um, ideal. Um, it's often hot, we're sweaty, um, we're gross. Um, and the truth is we secretly love it. We love going on these strange, bizarre adventures. Uh, we love the inventiveness and the resourcefulness that it requires to put together our equipment. Um, we love problem solving when everything is not going well. Um, and we love all the bizarre stories that we get to bring back from our field. And more importantly, um, science is not perfect, but it is important. So we mentioned in this talk before that we often find ourselves going back and redoing parts of our study and trying new things when the first few things didn't work out um, and re rewriting our papers and our research um, write-ups multiple times and submitting them and then having them edited and submitting them again. And this truly is just the process of science. And it is not perfect, but it is important. The imperfection is just built into the process of science. And so one thing we often find as scientists is that the public distrusts science when um, it becomes when, when people find out that it's not perfect and that we fail a lot in science and that we have to redo things a lot, um, they tend to take this as like, oh, well, that's a bad sign. But truthfully, that is the process of science is that we do have to go back and try things over and over and over again until we find uh, the right uh, way or the correct way to do it or the best way to do it um, until we get, uh, you know, until other scientists have looked at our research and challenged us to do better. Um, and so it's not perfect and that's the point and it is important. So to end, we just wanted to reiterate that field biologists and field work can be done in a lot of different settings. So we are both graduate students. A lot of you all are probably graduate students that are attending. And so we're more familiar with research in university settings, uh, but there's also a lot of other places that research is conducted, especially on the field. So zoos a lot of times have research programs focused on reproduction and conservation of species. And so they will have scientists that do research all over the world in the field to try to help all of the endangered species that we currently have on the planet. A lot of non-government organizations like Audubon and the Nature Conservancy and um, Xerxes uh, for Pollinators, which is one that's close to my heart, they uh, also have research scientists that are part of their organization. And their goals are generally to help understand, manage, protect certain species of interest. So like Audubon is birds, for example. Um, and so that is an avenue that a lot of people don't even know about, that they also need field biologists. Of course, government organizations like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Forest Service, every USDA, like all of them uh, need lots of researchers in a lot of different fields, including people like Olivia and I, who are more uh, biologists and ecologists 
And then a lot of private companies will also need people to go out and take samples in the field. So if they do environmental monitoring, for example, or environmental studies for developers, then they need people with field skills as well. So there are a lot of avenues open uh, for all of us that love to work in the field, even outside of the university. Uh, so with that, we are done. Uh, we'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have, uh, elaborate on misadventures we've experienced or whatever. But thanks for coming and uh, have a good rest of your night. All right, let's all give it up. I don't think we'll be able to hear anybody else clapping, but I can clap. Uh, so I'll give it up for Olivia and Allison. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of these uh, truths, I will say. You know, having wandered a sparsely populated country roads and been stung by plenty of bees myself, I related to a lot of what you said. Um, so thank you very much. Excellent work. Uh, folks, we have time for questions as the slide and Shrek indica indicate. So you can, let's see, you can put questions in the Q and A. Um, you can put questions in the comment section on Facebook Live. Uh, we have Julie monitoring that. And then if you raise your hand, I don't know if I can unmute you. Oh, I can, okay. Oh, I'm seeing a raised hand. Uh, Tyson has his hand raised. I'm going to allow to talk and we'll see what happens from that. <laughs> That's the wrong per. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong person now. Oh, maybe his hand was not raised. Never mind. All right, questions in the Q&A. Go for it. That's easier than raising hands. I also have a question that I can get us started. Very easy question to answer, maybe. Olivia, how many of those birds did you count? Oh man, okay. Um, you know, I wish Sarah were here to help me with the same question. We, there were sometimes we would stand on that ladder in the field for a little while and we wouldn't see any birds. Um, and so we would just melt under the 90 degree Michigan sun. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would go home. And there were some times where there was a lot of bird activity. So um, within like a 10 minute observation, maybe 10 to 15 birds at a time. Um, when counting kestrels, we'd walk eight miles and you'd be lucky if you saw one, so. Right. Sounds fun. It was riveting. I have a numbers question for Allison too. I'm curious actually, if you know, Allison, have you kept track of how many times you've been stung? Oh, I haven't. I lost count. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> it's been too many. <laughs> no, I can tell you I had one summer that I went almost the entire summer without being stung. And I was like, I'm going to make it. I'm not going to get stung. And then like in September, which is the end of the field season, like we start in June and we finish in September usually. I think there's just like one week left in my experiment. I got stung by like three different bees. No, no, no. I got that was the time I got stung by five bees because my record of no stings got like obliterated because I was beekeeping. The bees were angry. They're really angry in the fall usually because they're preparing for winter. So they don't like it if you come and look in their hive and disturb them. Uh, but I had to because I was helping them. I was treating them for mites, which can harm them. And I was by myself in the area. I opened it. They got mad. Um, they found a way to crawl up my bee suit. And so then I got four stings on one ankle and then one sting on the other ankle in a two minute period. And then two got into my veil. So then I also had two inside of the veil with me trying to sting my face. Mm -hmm. So I literally just abandoned the bee colony open, they, which made them even more mad. And I just ran because I was just getting attacked. And so I hobbled on my poor leg that afterwards and in a few hours had swelled up so much that I could not fit it into any of my shoes. I could not bend my toes or my ankle. Um, it was bad. I, I do react badly to bee stings though. And then I had to like rip my veil off in a way to get the bees out. One of them was caught in my hair, of course, and it was still trying to sting me, but luckily I have a lot of hair. So I was able to like use my phone to like see it and like 
flick it out and then run into another room and slam the door when it tried to come after me again. So that was the most eventful one. <laughs> what a but harrowing That was girl. just five in one day. Yeah. And then two attempt, two more were attempting, but didn't succeed. Uh, I think the record for my summer though, I think I got stung seven times one summer. That was a bad summer, <laughs> yeah. but generally it was once or twice, so. It's rough yeah. times, you know. Um, oh, we got some questions coming in. All right, perfect. Uh, I see one from Dawn. Thank you, Dawn. My grandson wants to be a zoologist. What are the beginning subjects that will benefit him? Olivia and Allison, that's all you. You know, I would really encourage him to dabble in all components of zoology. So zoology is a pretty broad field. Um, there are geneticists in zoology. There are um, people who study behavior. There are people who study the ecology um, and there are people who study like physiology. And so I would encourage him to just, um, you know, study all kinds of biology, see what really interests him, what really he enjoys spending his time on. Um, and yeah, just a, a wide variety of different types of biology. There are also like uh, the taxon classes, I guess I would call them, which are like mammalogy, ornithology, um, invertebrate zoology. Um, and those are where you get to say like a specific group of organisms like birds, reptiles. Um, and those are always fun and those are always really enjoyable. And they open students eyes up to a wide variety of animals because a lot of undergrads come in. And um, I think mo a lot of biologists I know have had this experience where they come into their degree and they're like, yeah, four years ago, I wanted to study lions in Africa. Um, and uh, everybody loves the very large charismatic mammals. And so I would also challenge anyone interested in zoology to study different groups of organisms because you really do discover how interesting other organisms are. Um, and I still love the charismatic megafauna. They still have a very special place in my heart and arguably raptors are charismatic megafauna. So I don't have a lot of room to talk. Yeah, I would just add, um, Olivia mostly covered it, but just never dismiss the value of just a, a good intro bio class, because in a good intro bio class, which you generally have to take um, in high school and in college, if you're interested in science, uh, you get a plethora of information about a lot of different subjects. So you'll do a unit on like genetics and how DNA works. You'll do something on organisms and on populations and you'll do ecology, you'll do evolution. So you'll get a sampling of a lot of different areas. And then you can kind of, uh, your grandson could see if there's one that really sticks out of like, oh my gosh, genetics was so cool. Or like for me, I'm like, oh my gosh, animal behavior is the most interesting thing in the world. Um, and so then that might kind of give some more direction. And then you can, as Olivia suggested, like take additional classes to kind of feed that interest. So take some genetics classes, take, um, uh, I don't know, animal behavior, like. For me, I, I did animal behavior and ecology because those were what I was interested in. Um, but definitely always good to start with the basics and then see what sparks your interest further. Awesome, thank you. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. I don't know, Julie, do we have any in the Facebook? I don't wanna hog the questions. I'm seeing her shaking her head, all right. No, we can keep going, yep. Perfect, uh, this one, <laughs> Have either of you had any moments during field research when you questioned all of your life choices that led you to that point? I'll say yes for me, uh, and then our two speakers. I can, can oh yeah, I can tell you I've questioned my life choices all the time, which sounds depressing because, but I'm always like, I don't regret it usually. When I get stung five times in a span of two minutes, I'm just like, I hate bees. And I don't hate bees, I'm just angry with them, but we'll work through it. You know, we worked through it. I'm actually going on to study bees again after I finish my PhD, so I'm gonna keep studying them. Uh, but yeah, you question a lot of things when you're out in the hot weather all the time, or like now where I am trying to finish my dissertation, I question things frequently because I just want to cry and give up, <laughs> but then you don't. And it's okay because you ultimately love it more than you are frustrated with it. 
Yeah, I agree with Allison and Darren, and I think uh, probably every graduate student I know has had a moment where they've questioned what they're doing and if this is something that they really want to continue on. Science is hard, um, and I've been thinking about this a little bit. Um, part of an inherent component of science is that there is always someone pointing out what you have done wrong or what you could improve on in your science. And that can put you in a very insecure and unsteady place sometimes because we're also people and we don't mean to take it personally, but we do. Um, and so I think every scientist I know has been in a place where they're like, do I belong here? Should I keep doing this? Um, and yes, there have actually been accident, absolutely been moments where I sit here and I am like, should I be doing this? Um, not often for me is it personally is it in the field though i think in the field i am i also have not been stung by five bees in two minutes um but in the field i am typically at my happiest um because i'm out the sun is shining usually um you know i'm getting to interact with organisms i really enjoy in their natural habitat and so usually it's when i'm alone uh, in this little corner thinking about research and all of the challenges I, I face. And I'm like, do I really want to keep doing this? Very relatable for sure. Okay. Got one more question here. Uh, another great question from Nicole. Was there some trigger or something that ultimately led you to your area of study? A mentor, an old interest slash love of birds slash bees. Why did you end up with your specific research project? Well, I can say for me, I was more interested in the question than the organism originally. So when I was an undergrad, I really loved animal behavior and ecology. And I wanted to understand like how, how do animals make decisions? Because that's especially small animals or animals that aren't super impressive in terms of their cognitive abilities. Like how are they still making decisions? How are they navigating a world that is weird and changing and we're changing it even faster. So how do they do that? Uh, and so that was one motivation. Another motivation is that with science, uh, you often get to travel a lot. So I've been to three different continents for my research uh, in undergrad versus in grad school. And so I was like, I wanna continue in science and study something that will allow me to travel and go study organisms in another country. So those were my motivating factors. And then I kind of looked to see what, what organisms, like what model system is how we generally term it, what would be best for that. And for me, bees stood out uh, because they are very, very clever. They're excellent at finding food and collecting food and navigation. They're excellent at navigation. They can do things with their little tiny, tiny brains that we can never do, that our GPS can't do. So to me, I was just like, wow, these are so, so smart. And they're so, so tiny. How are they doing that? And also bees are all over the world. And my advisor that I work with now, he had previously studied bees in India and in Thailand. And so I was like, ooh, can I do that? And he's like, yes, I want someone to do that. I'm like, great. So it worked out for me that I got to marry my love of travel and interest in traveling with these questions about how do animals make decisions? And it just came together in a nice way in bees. And now that I study bees, I love them. I think they're great. I mean, sometimes they make me angry because they sting me and it hurts, but like, it's generally my own fault because I scared them. Uh, but now I just also really love bees. So it's kind of interesting how you don't always start out um, being super driven by your model system. Like I had never interacted with bees. I'd never been stung with like, by a bee before I started grad school, but now I'm just like, Bees are the best. They're amazing. Let me talk to you about bees. And so it just worked out really well in my case. But that's where my motivation came from. Uh, I think mine, I actually, I was in, I was always a studious person and I liked biology. And so I thought I was going to be a doctor because that's what people who like biology do. Um, and I had a professor who told these wild stories of chasing these animals and di traveling to different places to study them. And there were all these crazy stories. He's my evolution professor from undergraduate. Um, 
And I was just like, I want to do what this guy does. And when I looked at his name in our like university directory, it said animal behavior. And so I looked more into that and I got involved in a behavioral research. And so um, in undergrad, and I wasn't initially interested in birds, but the professor that I did behavioral research with studied birds and kind of like Allison, I got exposed to the study system and got way more interested in birds um, after you know I started getting introduced to the science. And so I think for me, it was a mixture and a slow progression of the actual, the true perks of being a, a field ecologist, which are travel and working in beautiful places, um, working with really cool people who share my interests um, and uh, working with animals and like their natural habitat and also the really interesting questions in science and then kind of discovering all of these really cool things about animals that a lot of people just, you know, in their day to day life don't really need to know. Um, and so those things kind of all continued to build for me until I decided, even, you know, as I decided to, that I wanted to go to grad school, I didn't know all these things at first, but when I knew I wanted to go to grad school, um, more of this just kind of combined into like, yes, this is absolutely what I want to do. Sorry, I tilted my screen. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, we are at, it's 9.03. So I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. Do we have any, Julie, shaking? Hopefully I didn't accidentally like cancel the Facebook stream or something, because I was worried about that. <laughs> Apparently not. Okay. So if there are no final questions, uh, I want us all to, again, I will clap for everybody, maybe Julie can too, to thank our speakers, Olivia and Allison, for sharing their they're amazing field stories, hooray. I imagine everybody else is clapping as well. And thank you all for joining us for Biology on Tap. And now something pops up in the Q&A. It says, thank you, you're welcome. That's an easy one. Um, <laughs> and I hope you enjoy the rest of Science Fest. It goes on till April 30th, I believe, right? There's tons of stuff still going on all month. So check all that out and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everybody.